Japan's proposal or Japan's intention can be uh, well understood by uh, Southeast Asian colleagues or not. So uh, I think Singapore, uh, in a sense, is uh, very special to Japan uh, into the future, more into the future, because uh, I am talking about Japan's new approach, but yet uh, it has not sort of the new thing has not been consolidated. I think we need to go through trial and error process. And in that process, I think Singapore plays a very, very significant role, not vis-a-vis -vis Japan, not just vis-a-vis -vis Japan, but vis-a-vis -vis the, the whole region. So uh, I think uh, I would uh, today I would try to test with you my idea about future of East Asia as well. After I uh, explained uh, Japan's so-called new approach to Southeast Asia, uh, at the outset I have to say that I am not representing the Japanese government. As I said, I spent 10 years already in the private sector, teaching, uh, you know, writing. Uh, so I don't uh, speak for the government. Uh, I don't speak for the Prime Minister Abe. Uh, I may be uh, the person, I may be the last person who does this. <laughs> so, which does mean that my sort of observation uh, is independent and uh, uh, so let me still saying that indeed there has been new approach uh, since Prime Minister Abe assumed his post after LD, uh, DPJ uh, government fall, fell. Uh, Prime Minister, seen from outside, Prime Minister wanted to achieve three objectives. One, to strengthen Japanese economic capability. Two, he wanted to expand Japanese national security capability. Three, he wanted to strengthen Japanese strategic partnerships in the region. Let me explain each one. He clearly wanted to strengthen economic capability of Japan. Japan, as you all know, had suffered from last two decades. Japanese economic condition wasn't uh, as promising as it used to. Uh, he clearly wanted to sustain the economic level by using uh, the financial policy and also uh, public investment policy. Uh, as we all know, Abenomics so far had an immense success. It led to the boosted stock market. It led to a depreciated yen. The big companies in Japan were able to expand their export. They were able to uh, get more funding. Now, to some extent, they paid to their employees. Uh, by doing so, the Japanese uh, consumption market has expanded a little bit, but not sufficient. The moment of truth will come, because people talk about third arrow. The third arrow is said to be a substantive economic growth strategy. Uh, the government talked about TPP as part of this trade uh, uh, arrangement with U United States and some of the uh, Southeast Asian nations as a kind of a dynamic source of the, uh, uh, the third arrow, the uh, economic uh, uh, growth policy by by providing reforms, 
uh, in agriculture by uh, improving uh, various Japanese uh, economic uh, infrastructures by, by creating more demand. And that remains to be seen, to be very honest. That remains to be seen. As you know, Japan is suffering from the huge uh, deficit, financial deficit, and Japan is bound to raise tax. Uh, and the timing of tax increase is approaching. And people are talking about how precisely they would, the government would uh, apply this tax increase to various uh, uh, sort of food and all those uh, items which need uh, the uh, reduced tax rate. It has been debated for, for some time. So moment of truth will come soon in relation to the future of Japanese economic capability. I would very much hope that the economic capability of Japan and the Abenomics would be sustained because uh, Abe's public support rate is very much depending upon the economic sort of future of Japan. Uh, his public, uh, public uh, uh, support plate has gone down uh, to some extent because of the manner he produced the new legislation regarding the uh, national security uh, of Japan. As you know, Japan decided to reinterpret the constitution and uh, to provide uh, to, to the diet new legislation, but uh, uh, it has not been understood well in public, the, uh, the same argument. Uh, I will talk about it a little bit later, if you have any question. I think it's not to do with the substance of the registration, but it was a mana, the LDP or ABE, uh, sort of uh, produced in relation to the introduction of the bill to the diet and debate in the diet. So <coughs> that's point nine, number one. Point number two, <coughs> Prime Minister Abe, has succeeded, succeeded in expanding Japanese national security capability. Uh, it's unthinkable. I spent 36 years <coughs> in the Japanese foreign ministry. I was wanting very much to strengthen the Japanese security capability because I mean, it's amazing. When I was dealing with what we call North Korean contingency in nine, 1994, when there was a crisis triggered by North Korea in relation to nuclear development. In, remember, you may not be remembering this, but 1994, we talked about crisis on Korean Peninsula because North Korea declared that the implementation of economic sanction is meant the declaration of war. So we decided to prepare ourselves we found out that there were no basic law which, uh, which enabled us to prepare for the possible security threat from North Korea. How to deal with massive infra of refugees, how to support the United States military who is departing from the Japanese base in Japan, how to how to safeguard the uh, atomic facilities, the uh, civil atomic facilities in Japan? No law, <laughs> no basis. Amazing. There was, up until that time, there was a very, very easy thought. In case of crisis, United States will come to help us. That is a very basic, naive, thinking on the part of Japan, Japanese people, Japanese politicians. This, but still, there are, I was personally very much anxious to change that law. And when I was in charge of US-Japan Security Treaty in 1996, I worked very hard to create US-Japan Security in guidelines, national defense cooperation guidelines, but under, even under that exercise, there was a very, very specific criteria needed. We will do this under the traditional interpretation of the Japanese constitution, which does mean that 
you have self-defense right. If someone were to attack you, you can fend it off. Everything was, every Japanese facilities were kept for that. But now, when you talk about the crisis in Korean Peninsula, you just cannot distinguish the attack to, to be targeted, targeting on South Korea or United States or on Japan. Because all those facilities, base of the United States, situated in Japan, and those facilities were used for the sake of attacking North Korea in case North Korea were to uh, ag aggressive to South Korea. So, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Then we say, unless North Korea hit on us, we won't do anything. It doesn't make sense. So that's, although we sort of uh, expanded a little bit of the interpretation and we sort of worked for the new defense cooperation guideline in 1997 and we decided to send our troops to, uh, to the Gulf and Iraq as well for simply for the uh, non-military purposes. Uh, but now, Prime Minister Abe, I mean, so as I said, those are taboo subjects. I mean, there were lots of arguments in Japan and in uh, the neighboring nations. I was in Seoul two weeks ago, and there was one argument, Japan is moving towards militarism. No way, no way. J Japanese pacifism in the past was pacifism without substantive responsibility to defend its own country. So we have moved a little bit, but this cannot be something which is called as moving to a normal country or moving to a militarism. This is not. Still, Article 9 of the Constitution exists, and everything is in accordance, should be in accordance with Article 9. Abe decided to reinterpret the Constitution. I think it is the right thing. Abe decided to introduce various legislations to support the change of the Constitution. There are two absolute need. Uh, I mean, the reason for doing this is, uh, is based upon two uh, real needs. One, Korean Peninsula. If Korea were aggressive, we would have to be prepared to defend our country to support the United States and to defend South Korea. That's very, very clear in my mind. Second requirement is peacekeeping operation. How on the earth can we ask other military, military from Singapore, saying that please, please protect us? I mean, this was a basic attitude on the part of peacekeeping operations on Japan because they are free, armed. But they are not supposed to be shooting. They are not supposed to be, they can shoot those, those uh, terrorists or those uh, anti-government forces who are, you know, hitting Japanese, uh, self, Japanese peacekeeping, peacekeep, peacekeepers. But Japan is not supposed to help other peacekeeping uh, peace troopers who, who are being attacked by somebody else. Japan cannot shoot their weapon to help other peacekeeping operators. So this is just absolute nonsense. So now with this new registration, Japan can be much more forthcoming, much more proactive in the question of international security commissioned by United Nations that is that is not militarism, that is the international security cooperation. So those two. Abe, since uh, his uh, comeback to the prime ministership, uh, he made various things. Establishment of National Security Council, the change of the arms uh, embargo policy, the creation of national security strategy, the creation of secret law, the uh, reinterpretation of the constitution for, so that Japan can exercise limited collective self-defense. Those were considered taboo in the Japanese uh, political scene. But he was able to do it because he had absolute majority. He had a strong 
majority uh, in the uh, in, in in the Japanese diet. That's point number two. This expansion of Japanese uh, national security capability. The third element is the strengthening the strategic partnerships in the region. If you read all those articles, like uh, the communique uh, issued out of the Japan Mekon, the uh, summit meeting, or if you <laughs> read Japan ASEAN summit meeting sort of communique, I mean, it's very clear. It, it has not written this, but it is very, very clear in my mind. China, China. Yes, we have worries about future, the region, and China. Why? Because there are three elements which sort of signifies the changes of international structure in East Asia. Three. One, changing power balance and changing external attitude both on the part of the United States and on the part of China. Two, surge of isms. Isms means such as nationalism, fundamentalism. I mean, we used to contain it domestically, but yet it goes across the, board, across the border. If you look at Middle East, you look at Europe, I mean, this is not just the phenomena in East Asia. This is same all over the world. Changing power balance, isms, Russia. With changing power balance, United States is retreating. United States won't use you, you, their military ca capability as they used to do. There is a room for action and strong isms, the nationalism, in Europe, it's amazing. I was in UK, yes, last week, and Sweden. I mean, country like Sweden, it's a very, very liberal-minded nation. Surprising, but yet you have the sort of exclusive nationalism party. It's called Swedish Democrats, but yet they are proposing to expel all those Immigrants from Sweden. So uh, in UK, you have the independent, UK Independent Party. The uh, Labour Party is moving to, a, to, a, to a left as well. And this question of immigration is the issue of the day. And that created a much, much stronger nationalism type thing. Same thing applies in the region, China, in Japan as well. So. The changing power balance, changing attitude, the external attitude. I mean, China is not, I mean, this is. When I was director general for Asian affairs, the responsible person who, in the Japanese foreign ministry dealing with Asia, China, in terms of GDP, was one fourth of Japan, 2001. China surpassed Japan in terms of GDP 2010. When I retired foreign service 2005, I think it's around uh, August, I went to China 2005, and I had a public sort of symposium. And the foreign minister then, uh, foreign minister D, and myself had a debate. And he talked about, all the time talked about, peaceful rise. And I questioned, why do you use peaceful rise? We expect China to be peaceful. Why do you have to say that? I mean, clearly, China themselves are nervous. China themselves are tentative. They are changing the attitude, Deng Xiaoping's attitude of low-key attitude, because to China, economic growth was a number one priority. In order for China to be able to grow, they need a benign international relations. For that, it's better for China to take a 
low key attitude vis a vis the world, but now it changed. And 2005, it was changing. And 2010, China surpassed Japan. And now, China talks about not peaceful rise any longer. China talks about China, Chinese dream, China's dream, which implies many things, which implies many things. They first talked about establishment of new model of big power relationship, and particularly the United States is in mind. But they are now more, they are using more of the concept of a Chinese dream. I mean, this is an interesting period of time because we are not yet sure. Is China going to be content with the current international system and to rise peacefully and to be seen as a big nation alongside with the United States, but sort of based upon the existing international system? Or is China going to wish for creation of their system, the, the center, obviously, China set? I mean, this is very, very serious question we need to be asking for ourselves. So, one other thing, I, as I said, the United States is no longer most probably using its military capability unilaterally. They, I mean, Obama and even next president of the United States may consider the, uh, you know, the Bush way of using military capability is a little bit too much. So th there will be a different America. Uh, that is the background of it. The third element, the, the changing uh, East Asia. The changing element is Increasing interdependent relationship, interdependency. This is a new situation. China is not Soviet Union, obviously. We are all depending upon the market of China. Almost all the nations in Southeast Asia dependent on Chinese market. I mean, in the past, people are talking about Japanese market when, and the United States market when Japan, United States uh, were. Uh, to have the difficulty in economic affairs, the rest of the world will have a serious, serious illness. Uh, so the same thing applying to China, Chinese market, depending upon Chinese market, uh, we suffer. The inter international, I mean, the interdependency is a good element for creation of peace. So it's not all, at all bad, uh, only bad elements, good element, interdependent relationship, interdependency. So three elements, changing power balance, surge of isms, and also the increased interdependency. So you know, combination of those. I mean, very clear. Let us minimize the bad element of power balance, uh, let us contain isms, let us expand interdependent relationship by sort of combination of three, we can achieve peace. But yet, the world is not that easy. Uh, then let me talk about the third element, the Japanese Abe-san's third element, the enhancement of strategic relationship with the rest of the world, the clearly, uh, the uncertainty surrounding China. Uh, very strong in the mind of Prime Minister Abe, he, is, he thinks Japan needs to be stronger. He thinks that only Japan cannot cope with China. He thinks that strategic relationship with the rest of the world is very important because strategic relationship does mean that we have common interest. Common interest, common interest meaning that we wouldn't like to see hegemonic China. We, I mean, China is strong enough. Let us, let us acknowledge it, but yet we would not like to see uh, China seeking for a hegemon. So strategic expansion of strat strategic relationship does mean that we would like to create partnerships with countries who have common concerns, common interests as well. Uh, I mean, it's very clear that we have Southeast Asia as the key for this strategic relationship. 
Japan. When I was in Japan, I was in the Japanese Foreign Ministry. The kind of basic objective of, of our ASEAN policy is very, very different. We genuinely thought, I mean, as you know, in the late 70s, the former Prime Minister Fukuda produced what we call Fukuda Doctrine. And if you read it again, it talks about three things. The Japan will never be military giant. Japan wish to maintain equal partnership with ASEAN. Japan wishes to create heart-to-heart -heart relationship. In a sense, very naive. Japan felt from the recognition of the past, Japan needs to be low-key to Southeast Asia. Japan, Japanese economy, there is a lot to gain from stronger Southeast Asia. Japanese economies. And again, if you remember that in 1985, there was a Plaza Agreement, and Japanese yen appreciated. And there were massive investment into Southeast Asia that helped Southeast Asia. So that was a key component of the Japanese policy these days. It's much more economic oriented. It's much more sort of, you know, history oriented in a sense. And Southeast Asia is a good entity for Japan because Southeast Asia is not that sort of, uh, you know, Singapore, for instance, is, uh, there is, uh, we have historical baggage as well. But yet, Singapore is not using history as an excuse to attack Japan. But China, Korea, are much more difficult in that sense. So Japanese Southeast Asia policy is more sort of history oriented, the economic oriented, and again, the word like ASEAN consideration. Japan needs to give consideration to ASEAN. That is a very basic policy of Japan. And we talked about ASEAN should be in, in a driver's seat, in a driver's seat. We talked about all this East Asia summit making, uh, Ambassador Tanchinton was so instrumental in creating this, but yet we talked about let ASEAN take a driver's seat. Uh, people may <laughs> say different things these days. Driver doesn't have intention, so <laughs> driver's seat may not be a good sort of uh, usage of words, but yet we thought that ASEAN needs to be upfront. That was our policy uh, up until recent, but now there has been a significant change. The Japan's ASEAN policy is very much uh, led by the concept of expansion of strategic partnership. If you look at precise nature of the Japanese cooperation to East Asia, Southeast Asia, in the official sector ODA continue to be the main source of funding to ASEAN, and they talk about quality, high quality infrastructure. And I don't know, why do, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about uh, this precise uh, background of this, but yet it seems to me that clearly Japan is trying to expand its own advantage by, you know, talking about high quality infrastructures green sort of, uh, you know, economic cooperation type thing, we would sort of distinguish ourselves from, say, the way China conducts affairs in the region. Japan talks about the rule of law instead of the unilateral action. Uh, behind of which stronger military power. No, Japan tried to sort of make clear that Japan's way is preservation of rule of law. Japanese way is the creation of much more sort of high quality infrastructures. Japan has strong interest in making sure that ASEAN you know, disparity in ASEAN, income disparity in ASEAN. I mean, this is a crucial issue for ASEAN. ASEAN cannot be integrated if the current disparity exists 
among the nations, ASEAN, all those, uh, you know, the uh, Mekong Delta. That's the reason why Mekong Delta is a, I mean, it may be good for you, good for ASEAN, because it, it is a competing ground for Japan and China. I mean, for ASEAN, the more, the better. I mean, it's a good policy, no question about it. No question about it. But yet, there is a need for management. There is a need for management. Uh, that is what uh, we probably need for ASEAN side as well. Now, I think Japan, as I said, Japanese uh, policy to Southeast Asia, Asia is an extension of past policy, but yet these days I sense more element of the strategic partnership. China in mind. China is not a threat. China is not an enemy. China is an important partner, but yet, unfortunate, we do not know the future of China. Let me talk about future of China very quickly. I do think there are two risks associating with future of China. One, the question of domestic governance. Domestic governance, which may be becoming unstable due to the economic growth. I mean, in China today, everything priority is with economic growth. Without economic growth, China cannot sustain the current system in China. China is doing rather impossible thing. China trying to introduce market mechanism, China trying to introduce the concept of rich China. China is trying to introduce a kind of normal management of macroeconomic policy, mm -hmm. but yet against the background of, you know, the strong cohesive power of the communist government. Although there are huge number of internet users, the public phone and all sorts of things, but yet lack of freedom, the uh, lack of uh, you know laws, the transparency and all sorts of things. So, if the economic growth goes down, say less than five percent, then there will be we will hear more of the complaint on the part of people that may lead to a mass development criticism against the government uh, because there are you know many issues social issues like the uh, environment like energy policy like agriculture like income disparity and all sorts of thing it is can be easily set fire if economic growth is uh, less than expected so we're not entirely sure it will I mean we will suffer from it the, uh, the economic downturn of China, we undoubtedly suffer from it. The Xi Jinping talks about reform. He talks about reform in state industries. The most difficult thing, I wish he succeed in it. This, uh, his uh, very strong grip on anti-bribery campaign, good, good. And, uh, but it is, he, probably he meant for the you know, getting rid of vested interests so that he could pursue the reform in the, in the economy. I hope very much that Chinese will succeed in it. But risk remains. Risk is there. The second risk, which is much more troublesome for us, expansion of China. We're not entirely sure, but seeing from their aggressive action vis-a-vis -vis South China Sea, East China Sea, you may, you may say that the question of Senkaku, for instance, Japan uh, has its own problem. But mind you, this question of Senkaku has been sitting there from the very beginning. When Japan established diplomatic relations with China in 1972. The issue was there. Issue was there all along. But why it has become such an explosive issue? Simply because 
China has become big simply because China has become more aggressive. I mean, it's very natural. It's very, very natural when a country becomes bigger, the, their attitude becomes, you know, much more aggressive, in a sense, Japan as well. So I'm not complaining about Chinese expansion of their capability, but you cannot deny the fact we can expect more of those as China gets bigger. South China Sea? I, I have concerns, genuine concerns. Because if you look at the past history, long history of China and Southeast Asia relationship, China was absolutely strong entity. So I don't know into the future how things will evolve. So with all risks, there is going to be the most important element here. Chinese future may depend upon what action we take. Chinese future may be dependent, dependent also upon our policies, our meaning, both Japan and Southeast Asia. Now, on this, my view, my, uh, my uh, sort of way of thinking may be different from uh, the government of today in Japan. I agree to the expansion, the need for, uh, you know, continue to expand Japanese economy. I quite agree to the uh, the uh, the uh, expansion of the Japanese uh, national security capability. Uh, I agree to the strong st strengthening of the uh, the strategic relationship with with ASEAN, with China, no, no not China, with Australia, with uh, India, with uh, with Korea as well. I mean it's. So in its way, and even trilateral way, Japan, Australia, United States. But yet, I think there is a need of vision on the part of the Japanese government for the future. Because Japan, so far, for the past three years, succeeded in consolidating strength of Japan. And Japan can use more of their variety of sort of tools, diplom diplomatic tools, including ODA, the, the private uh, funding, private uh, technologies, the uh, environmental, the all, and even international security cooperation, like joint exercises, like the provision of ships, or all sort of the uh, non-traditional security issues as alike. Japan can be much more proactive. But yet, I say in Japan uh, that the international security structure, international security environment can only be improved by diplomacy. I think it is important for us to have solid national security capability, but yet, the betterment of the security situation rests with proactive diplomacy. So Japan needs to produce right vision for that. For that, yes, the East Asia, Southeast Asia is not simple. It is very, very complicated. I wish ASEAN were integrated, but it is not possible. I wish ASEAN were to produce the you know, the one view vis-a-vis -vis the question of China. But it's, it's not the case, and I do, we should not uh, blame ASEAN for that. But the situation being so, our approach needs to be very multifaceted, multi-layered, very dynamic, but yet very complex. I am calling for what we call multi-layered functionalism which means that we cannot produce one single community. Unfortunate, 
because we are known for diversities, we cannot create East Asia community. But yet, let's start doing multi-layered functionalism, which means depending upon functions, we have different types of gatherings, different types of cooperation. Security, in terms of national security, we have as I said, US-Japan Security Treaty that needs to be consolidated, strengthened. We need to settle somehow the question of Okinawa as well. This, and again, we should promote this trilateral security cooperation with uh, Australia, India, and you know, with the United States. But at the same time, we need to create confidence building mechanism. <laughs> this is, as I said, interdependent period. We don't want to have an accident. We don't want to have a you know, near war situation by, without any intention. Let us create confidence building mechanism. Uh, for the meantime, I would very much like to see four parties to create the confidence building mechanism. United States, China, Japan, and Korea, because all those military are in the region. So that's one element. Two, let us have mechanism in which China being included. One, the trade and investment. We talk about the TPP. TPP is good, not just good at present form. TPP is significant for the future. For the future, because it talks about various rules. Rules regarding the, the uh, the state industries, like the, the intellectual property, like government procurement, like it or not, like it or not, as a nation matures, you need that type of high-level rules. So I would very, very much hope that all the ASEAN nations will eventually join in. And I would very much hope for Korea to join in it. And end of the day, I would very much like to see China to join it. It takes probably 10 years for China to join it. But yet, only when that TPP is needed as a vehicle for us to promote the economic integration in the region based upon high level Rules. Meanwhile, I think ASEP, the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement, ASEAN plus uh, 16, ASEAN plus 6, 16 nations would be. I, I am strongly hoping that those two, TPP and RCEP, will become effective almost the same time. That creates a sort of different layered economic investment mechanism, and that will lead to the future, bigger concept. Then the question of energy. There is a very, very absolute need for energy cooperation. In the region. Think about this. In 2050, 35 years from now. By the way, I take the theory that Japan-China relationship moves very significantly with the interval of 40 years, 40 years. When Admiral Perry, Commodore Perry came to Japan, it's 1853. And after 40 years, Japan, China fought. And after 40 years, this is the Second World War, Japan, China, Japan started aggressive to China. And Japan, China war, after 40 years, Japan, China normalization in 1972. And after 40 years, China surpassed Japan in terms of GDP. What matters me? What matters to Japan? What matters to Southeast Asia? 2050, what is going to happen to ASEAN? I mean, it is, in my view, it is very clear vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Unless Japan needs to do something about uh, the, the population, Japanese population will decrease by 30 million people. 30 million people. Japanese will go down absolute mi minus in terms of growth. But think about this, 2050, the East Asia will produce more than half of the world GDP. 
this is undoubtedly the center of the growth, no question, which does mean that this region is this region is using energy a lot. The energy competition will become fierce. I mean, it's very clear. South China Sea, East China Sea, on the land, the China talks about uh, the AIIB and also this uh, one belt, one load concept. Energy is an important component for that there would be much fierce energy competition. And also the question of uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, nuclear projects. The, there are massive amount of the uh, uh, nuclear reactors uh, projected, planned in China, in India, in Indonesia, in Korea. I think safety of nuclear uh, nuclear uh, reactors are very, very important. And environment cooperation would be needed. I mean, this is nothing to do with ideologies. This is nothing to do with the, the strategies. This is to do with the prosperity. The, uh, I think the, uh, we should uh, join hand for the sake of uh, this uh, a very substantive cooperation in the field of both energy and environment uh, in the context of East Asia Summit. Because East Asia Summit has the right configuration. East Asia Summit is, you know, let us not expand the number, but now think about very core substantive cooperation. Uh, this is a concept of the uh, multi-layered functionalism. You have different types of cooperation, you have different type of schemes. But yet, if you look at the whole thing, it suffices the current elements of the changes taking place uh, in the world, uh, and in particular in East Asia. Uh, I I don't know, Singapore is, is good for a venue. Uh, not just venue, but yet I think uh, Singapore must be in the central position to talk about future of East Asia. I thank you very much.